Well, welcome everyone. Uh, it is an absolute honor to be your host for this evening. My name is Professor Alan Duffy. I'm the director of the Space Technology and Industry Institute at Swinburne University of Technology. Uh, and among other things, I have to say I'm an absolute huge fan both of this wonderful uh, space in which we're meeting, the Science Gallery in Melbourne, uh, but also of uh, Dwayne Hamaker, but we'll get to him and my praise for him and his efforts uh, very soon. Before all that, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, the Wurundjeri and Buurong people of the Kulin nations. I pay my respects to the elders past, present, and emerging. Extend those respects to all Aboriginal, uh, Torres Strait, and First Island peoples with us this evening. As this work shows, the first astronomers of the world, and indeed in a continuing sense in their knowledge, they are the true custodians of the site, and in particular with our Space Institute at Swinburne, I want to acknowledge those uh, peoples and their heritage. We try and follow in your footsteps. Now, this evening, I'm very pleased uh, to announce that 100% of the author royalties from the First Astronomer's Book will go to charities supporting scholarships and programs for First Nations people and communities. But I get a little round of applause for that. Thank you. And now having heard that, I want to alert you to the fact that you can make tax deductible donations to those same charities through the Royal Society of Victoria's website. So please go to the RSV and give generously. Now, speaking of generosity, this event is generously sponsored by the Indigenous Studies Unit, uh, the Indigenous Knowledges Unit, and the Laby Foundation at the University of Melbourne, uh, Astro 3D Center of Excellence, and I welcome their new uh, director, Stuart Weiss, in attendance, the Royal Society of Victoria, and of course, the Science Gallery Melbourne itself. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Alan and Unwin for their uh, support and publishing of this incredible work, and our thanks to uh, Ellie Gilbert for generously filming the event. This, of course, is all about the book, and the book is available to be purchased this evening. There are 45 copies. Um, will they be signed? We'll say that, sure. Yeah, they'll be signed now. Um, so again, please do uh, buy a book. And I have to say, I was, I was very fortunate to get uh, an advanced copy and to have a, a read. I, was, I gave a very long, enthusiastic, um, supporting words for the book, which I was told to then shorten, because uh, that should itself not be a book. Um, why does it matter? I came to Australia and uh, I was a, a professional astronomer. Uh, I came to this country, I knew everything about uh, the southern skies, uh, large Magellanic clouds, southern, uh, uh, small Magellanic cloud. I, I knew about like this. What I didn't know was anything at all about indigenous knowledge of that sky. The people who had studied it, the patterns, understood and could predict connections between sky and land for tens of thousands of years, who through oral uh, uh, tradition had preserved the knowledge of astronomical events, explosions of stars, asteroid impacts. And now thanks to this book, there won't be some rando Irishman coming in and having that kind of ignorance. It matters that a book that collates indigenous knowledge is available to Western audiences because then we can begin to understand, we can begin to have the appropriate respect for that depth of knowledge, continuing knowledge today, and we can learn from it. And indeed we have in recognizing those uh, uh, events, believing in the accuracy of those uh, oral traditions, and then going and observing and finding those celestial events, the explosion of stars, the remnants of these supernovae. That's why this book matters. And now you can see why I was told to shorten my little blurb for the cover. All right, enough from me. I want to uh, uh, welcome to the stage Nawit Carolyn Briggs, AM, a senior uh, Yalagat Willem and Boonwurrung elder and founder and chair of the Boonwurrung Foundation. She was recognized as National Aboriginal Elder of the Year in 2011 by the National NAIDOC Committee and earned a PhD in media and comms 
sorry, communication, from RMIT University, assisting indigenous urban youth in connecting with indigenous knowledge. Please welcome to the stage, Gareth. Firstly, I'd like to pay my respects to all of you and to Professor Marcia Langton, who I've known for a long time, and also Michael Anderson. It's been a long journey, you know, and here we are on, amongst it. And to you, Dwayne, for allowing us to be a part of this whole story and sharing our stories. So firstly, I'm doing the welcome, so I'll get off that part. <laughs> So Wamanjika Marambik Big Bunarong Namda Burupton Arthur Willem. Come with a purpose to our beautiful home, the lands of the two great bays, Nam, Port Phillip Bay and Marin, Western Port Bay. And I am a proud descendant of the Illigat Willem of the Eastern Kulin Nation. And it is my pleasure to be able to welcome you all here this evening but it is also my responsibility to sure, ensure that you do come with a purpose. Womanjika, come, ask to come and what is your intention? I do so not only on behalf of my ancestors, the Wurrung, I do so on behalf of all First Nations peoples on which lands we meet today. First Nations people across Australia all share a special connection to the lands and waters of their ancestors that has not been disconnected since millennia. Despite the dispossession, the displacement, the discrimination that we've all experienced over the last 200 years plus. These connections date back to our creation stories. For the Yalakut Willem, our creation stories tell us of Bunjil, our creator spirit who travels as an eagle and how he created the lands and waters around where we meet today. He also created the Kulin people and taught them about the circular relationships that they have with these lands and waters in order for us to be taken care of by the land. And this is about the reciprocal process. We also had to take care of the land and we did this through adhering to our Warungi Bek, our laws of the land, our customary laws, much like our laws today. These laws dictated how we interact with each other, much like, um, sorry, and how we interact with the land and how we conduct ourselves whilst we're on other people's countries. The Bunwarang Warungi Bek speaks of three Pacific laws. That first law is your land. It is the responsibility that we do have knowledge. And once that knowledge has been attained, we have the responsibility to ensure its survival, its continuation. We have the responsibility to our younger generations to maintain that knowledge and also and pass it down so it can be used for your and boy, our future generations. We have the law of Jembana. This law speaks of community, the importance of communities, the importance of our diverse communities, but a unified community. The Bunwurrung people and the Kulin Nation understood the power of diversity that is within our lands and how it increases our capabilities. It was always good to share these stories and and different experiences. However, they understood how to utilize this very powerful tool. They had to identify a common purpose. And what are those things that we do all have in common? Finally, there's the law of our connection to country, or we might call it honoring Pavanata or sacred ground, Mother Earth, paying respects to past generations that of people or the people who took care of the land before us and the people who have lived and died on this land before we were all here, paying respects to that, those stories and history on our land on which we live today. 
it is very unfortunate in this continent we now know as Australia to have 80,000 plus of human history. And it is important to pay respects to that history, not only while you're here, or when you're at work, or when you go home. And if we can adhere to those three Warongi Beks, I can say in the words of my ancestors once again, Wamanjika, Marambikbik Punarong, Namda, Barupted, Arta Willem, come with a purpose to our beautiful home. And it is about what we invite you to this evening is to be a witness or a small glimpse into our culture, which we have chosen to share with you. And it is about those sort of, about the first astron astronomers. It is a vital part of our culture. And traditionally it still is today. And it's that, that understanding of what astronomy meant to us. We, we talk about our stars, we talk about our waterways, we talk about it all in, encompassed as one. So we need to think about understanding how we read and it was not written as what a uh, script, it was something that was well truly documented from the stars to the ground, understanding how we connect. These are our life ways. This is what guided us to where we are today and that we are one of the oldest living cultures that is very important that we still can adhere to those, the rules and that we are going through this regenerating those memories. So it's really important for us to have a guide, share our stories with Wayne and to our younger people to come on this journey with us, to understand these amazing constellations in our great southern skies that taught life ways and how we work with our waterways because everything was guided by our moon and the lunar. We come from the people of the lunar, the 13 moons. So everything was guided with the moon, the stars. It's about our life ways. So I suppose I'm getting lost a little bit here, standing up here, but it is about sharing. And I'm very fortunate my grandchildren are from the Torres Strait and um, very much important even knowing some of the old people that are a part of this um, production of um, Dwayne's stories in here and the works that we've seen around in the other part of the room of these beautiful illustrations that remind us that we still have a connection one to each other and the way the production of works with Passy and these beautiful and the generation that came after. They were, the, they, they were the very much of the early activists of Marbo and these are the things we need to understand. Nothing is in isolation. Neither are you. We're all here as a collective and it's about bringing you along with the stories of the oldest knowledge structures that guided our life ways. And I suppose it's really important about understanding our lands, waters, skies of this place that extended to all First Peoples around this continent. Is there anything else? I've been talking out there. I hope this starts the beginning of the conversation because there's lots of conversations and lots of stories that will be shared with you because it's a, just a small glimpse about our world and we share that world with you. So your being guests on this country is very important that you understand this country and val value it as we have valued it over those many millenniums. So this we just keep reiterating the stories and giving a platform as such as what Dwayne has produced through the first astronomers and, and having that deep sense of listening to many storytellers that are still vibrant in this landscape today. So I'm going to leave it there and I pay my respects to all of you here tonight because you're on a beginning of a new learning, our way.
our Indigenous knowledge ways. Two ways of knowing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Briggs. Now we will uh, turn to Professor Marcia Langton, AO, an Imam woman and Redmond Barry Distinguished Professor, Associate Provost, and has previously served as Foundation Chair of the Australian Indigenous Studies at the University of Melbourne, uh, sorry, continues the 2000. She was a prominent public intellectual and advocate for Aboriginal rights and wrote the foreword for the first uh, astronomers, and I think it's a rather fitting, I'm hopeful that everyone in the background can see, but maybe we're about to hear from Professor Langton about exactly that. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Uh, thank you, Anna Carolyn. Uh, uh, I acknowledge the traditional owners here and their elders past and present. There are quite a few elders in the room. Lovely to see you all this evening. Um, so uh, I had the very great, great pleasure of writing the foreword to this book and I think I also wrote a, uh, contributed a book blurb uh, as it's called in the, by some of us uh, and I said in the, for the book blurb that it's a magnificent achievement and it certainly is. Uh, so no one has ever done, made a book like this before. Uh, so uh, I wanted to acknowledge not just Dwayne, Associate Professor Dwayne Hummaker, uh, for his uh, extraordinary contribution over many years, but also uh, his co-authors, uh, who are several elders, uh, Gillar Michael Anderson, who's here this evening, um, John Barsa, David Boson, Ron Day, Siga Parsi, and Alo Tuppen. Um, and the book is the result of 10 years of patient research. Um, and there's so much more to the book than you might think at first. So I'll just tell you a little story. I went to a principals conference in Queensland, a conference convened uh, by the Queensland government of all the school principals in Queensland and I spoke to them about uh, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander curricula project. Uh, this was some years ago when we had made the first cut through in producing curricula that incorporated Indigenous knowledge such as the work that Duane's done with many elders about Indigenous astronomy. I spoke uh, I presented a speech with a PowerPoint, explained how we did it, explained Indigenous knowledge using Indigenous astronomy, Indigenous use of fire and, and Indigenous knowledge of water to explain how we had created curricular resources for all schools in Australia, for all children in Australia that incorporate Indigenous knowledge in a rigorous way. The MC stood up after my speech and said, thank you for that wonderful talk about Indigenous astrology. Um, my heart sank. Um, and, and fortunately, Kerry O'Brien was sitting next to me. <coughs> so I wrote Indigenous astronomy on a note paper and put it in front of him. Uh, and and, and he, he understood what I was saying, so he got up and um, had to correct the record there but you know but I had the same problem all the way through the project with government bureaucrats because we were funded by the government to do it in the first instance um, but I, 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 I want to say this to you uh, I read I've re I read the book I was lucky enough to be asked to write the foreword and so I had to read the book and uh, <laughs> And, and uh, you know, I'm absolutely thrilled because this is the textbook that we wanted for all those children. 
and for all of those teachers in the 10,000 schools in Australia. Um, and it demonstrates that this is astronomy. You know, this is the real stuff of astronomy. Uh, and I, I will, in fact, uh, make sure that it's in 10,000 schools. It might take a little while, but we'll get there. Um, so I want to acknowledge Dwayne especially because he joined our expert panel in 2017 on the curricula project. And uh, I've had many inquiries from teachers about his contrib contribution on Indigenous sky knowledge. Um, and you can be sure, Dwayne, that many schools are using your work. Um, but now we have this wonderful book um, written with the elders, as I say. And I want to say also, well, I think I've already said it, that this is a first. There's no book like this. Um, previously, we have some theses, you know, uh, on, on the website, aboriginalastronomy.com.au, you'll find lots of references and research. But this book pulls it all together. And it's extraordinary to learn um, that uh, there, that Indigenous astronomers, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island astronomers, knew about certain phenomena long before, you know, Western astronomers did. Uh, and I'm not going to give you any spoilers. You're going to have to read the book and find out for yourself. Um, and I also want to say that people might think it, at the outset that there's a Western logic ap applied to Indigenous knowledge here and that, you know, this is just a fairly ordinary interpretation of Indigenous knowledge. That's not the case at all. Very far from the truth. So you'll have to read for yourself how Indigenous astronomers knew about the sun, the ecliptic, sunspots, solstices, the seasons in enormous detail um, and how they uh, express their knowledge about these. Um, uh, the aurora astralis, uh, the variability of Betelgeuse and I could go on and on and uh, like Auntie Carolyn I don't want to take up a lot of time but I have said that this book is a magnificent achievement and there's nothing like it. And obviously, then once you've read the book, your whole worldview changes as like you've just, you know, learned something so significant that, you know, you can't ever go back. It just changes your, your worldview of science, of science and how it's practised. So... Uh, Find out for yourselves. It's a great experience. But I also really want to acknowledge what Alan referred to before, uh, that 100% of author royalties go to charities supporting programs for First Nations people and communities. Royalties from book sales in Australia go to the Australian Association of Astronomy and Culture. Royalties from book sales in Aotearoa, New Zealand, go to the Society of Maori Astronomy Research and Traditions, chaired by Maori astrophysicist Dr Pauline Harris. Royalties from book sales internationally go to Native Sky Watchers, chaired by Lakota astrophysicist Dr Annette Lee. Um, so congratulations, all of you, Dwayne, Gillar, uh, and all the Torres Strait elders, uh, pass on to them my gratitude for this wonderful work and Many congratulations. Professor Langton, thank you for your words. I'll now call Dwayne Hamaker, Associate Professor of Cultural Astronomy uh, at the Astro 3D Centre of Excellence and School of Physics at the University of Melbourne to the stage, but uh, of course more relevantly for tonight, he is the author of The First Astronomers, Dwayne. Oh. 
Thanks, everybody. Well, this is really weird for me. I've never experienced anything like this. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, it's been quite a journey with this book over the last was it, five years ago, I think, I started writing it. Um, and it's it's been my honor to do what the elders have asked me to do. This work is guided by them. It's guided by their wishes for what this can do for the world and how we can really change the conversation about what science is, how we conceptualize the ideas of science, and how we can change and alter the history and philosophy of science. So yes, to the certain people out there, I am rewriting history. Well, I'm not doing it. Yelder's rewriting it. I'm simply the conduit for that. So I want to thank everybody for coming out and, and celebrating this book, which has been uh, quite an effort over the years. But I really wanted to spend this event and tonight platforming the elders and the people from whom this knowledge really comes. I did want to mention the other elders who have been a part of this. Of course, before I do that, I want to thank Alan. I appreciate you so much for donating your time to come out and do this. It's been fantastic. Um, I know you're in a rush to get here, trying to battle uh, Melbourne peak hour traffic going the other way, but I really appreciate you coming out here deeply. Um, of course, Auntie uh, Nobby Caroline Briggs, it's, it's always a pleasure when you come and speak. I love learning from you, hearing about you, uh, getting ribbed by you a bit from time to time, which is all part of the process, right? We have a lot of fun. Uh, Marcia, I mean, you've, you've, you've been phenomenal in, in helping to make sure this work gets done. If it wasn't for you, it wouldn't be getting done. Um, at the end of the day, you know, I can do some of this work and stuff, but if, if, the, if the avenues aren't there for it to get done, it doesn't get done. The support hasn't been there, nothing's going to happen. Of course, the support has been there um, like a tsunami, and I, I, I appreciate that more than you can imagine. And, you know, the University of Melbourne has been tremendously supportive of this. The School of Physics has been extremely warm and welcoming. Um, giving a green light to all the wonderful things we're doing with new courses and subjects and programs. So I want to thank the School of Physics. I want to thank everybody at the University of Melbourne. It's been a home that I never quite expected. Um, Ten years ago when I when I came to a conference, no, 11, 12, time flies, whatever it was, a long time ago, I came to a conference and thought about the idea of indigenous astronomy right after I started my PhD. And when I would talk to some other PhD students, they thought I was kind of wasting my time. Some were supportive, but the overall idea was this isn't real science. I thought, could I imagine ever trying to convince the physics community, especially to place at like the University of Melbourne, that this stuff is real, it's the real deal. And less than 10 years later, I'm an associate professor in that same department. I can't imagine how a, a better, more welcoming environment than what we've had here since then. So I did want to mention the other elders who've been a part of this work, who've been central to it. Um, there's been a lot more than these six. I could only put six down because of the, the restrictions of the, the trade book industry. Um, my initial draft had about 85 elders who contributed to it in some way or another. Uh, John Barsa was a Torres Strait knowledge holder whom I only had one meeting with for two hours. In that two hours, he shared with me a wealth of knowledge that has not been paralleled since. Everybody kept saying, talk to John Barsa, talk to John Barsa. He knows the stars. We sat down in a beaming afternoon. I know some of us were needing sunglasses here for a few minutes as the sun was going down. And he shared a wealth of knowledge with me, which I've still not gotten through completely. And we were talking during the day, and we wanted to sit outside at night. So we tried to make arrangements for that. But life just kept getting in the way. It didn't quite happen. And whenever I would come back to the tourist street, we kept missing each other. And um, in, early, in early 2018, um, Uncle Alo Tapi and one of the other 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 elders gave me a phone call and said that um, John Bars had passed away. Um, he was only in his mid-50s. So he and um, another elder, Darwell elder, uh, Uncle Les Bursell, who mentored me during my early journey when I was doing my PhD. Um, he brought me in under his wing, taught me, taught me the ropes, because here's this dumb American who knows nothing about Aboriginal culture whatsoever, coming in, trying to learn about astronomy. And uh, he was always very supportive. Um, support me, but also put me in my place if I ever stepped out of line. That's something I've always deeply appreciated. So I dedicate this book to those two gentlemen. And I met Uncle um, Les the day before he passed away. He was in the hospital in Nowra. And I was driving back from Sydney. And I, I stopped, met him in the hospital, and he was super excited to see me. We were chatting a little bit. Um, he, had, he had had surgery. Uh, 
And I told him about the book. This is 2019, January 2019. And his face lit up. He was so excited about that. And uh, he, he passed the next day. His, he and his family were both uh, very supportive of his name still being used afterwards, of course, which is why I'm talking about him, but also supporting this work over the years. Uh, David Bozen is a, a Mulaga man and an artist. That's one of his artworks out here. Um, he shared a tremendous wealth of knowledge with me over the years and has been extremely supportive. And you'll see some of his artwork in the book. Uh, Father Ron Day is one of the senior elders on Mare, and he has sat with me numerous times and shared so much knowledge. It's, it's been over the years, I'll be doing this for another decade, still can't even get through everything. Um, Uncle Seagar Passy is an artist and he's a senior elder on Mare. It's his artwork that graces the book, which is this right here. Um, and I want to pay a special thanks to Elsie Passy, his daughter, um, who's been very helpful in this process as well. And of course, Uncle Alo Tapim, who's been the main elder I've sort of communicated with over the years. He's always taken my phone calls, uh, been happy to deal with this weird American coming up constantly and, and asking about this stuff. But they were the ones who wanted this knowledge shared. And I've tried to put the book in a global context, so it's not just Australia. But we talk about a whole load of things in there. And what I would like to do now is introduce the first elder, and the sixth elder, but the first one listed, is Uncle Gillar Michael Anderson. Uncle Gillar is a senior lawman, a Uwagi elder, and one of the co-founders and last sole surviving member, uh, founder of the Tent Embassy, the Aboriginal Tent Embassy in 1972. You've got a very long and distinguished career, Uncle, and I really appreciate you coming down all the way from Gaduga, driving down yesterday to join us today. I'd like to invite you up so we can come and have a bit of a chat for the next half hour. So, Uncle. Thank you both. Uh, I wanted to get started. In, in my opening words, I, I, you know, I, I spoke about why, the, why I think the book matters, why it matters to me personally. I want to start with you, uh, Killer, if you don't mind. Why, why does the book matter to you? Why does it matter that this book now exists? Can I just say, first of all, um, thank you for the welcome. Um, yeah, and thank you, Marcia, um, for your critique of this and making it all possible of making sure that this guy gets to carry on some work and make it all possible. Um, and I thank the university for its um, yeah, participation in all of this and, and um, creating a, a division within the university for, to educate people about this. It's important. What, one thing that's missing out of this book, um, <laughs> <coughs> one very important thing, well, well I, think it, I think it's the most important thing, um, like Bill Harney, um, the old man, is, he's done a lot of work in the Northern Territory. And um, he made reference when he talks about his knowledge of the stars. He learned it not from the men, he learned it from the women, his mother, his grandmother. I did too. Yeah. The men um, told me about all the hard factors, but all the other um, stuff around what's happening up there comes from the women. And... Um, and the women's knowledge is not in this book yet. And so we need to write a book that allows us to address the women's issues. <laughs> but yeah, that's so, you know, I'm just standing in. <laughs> <laughs> but you're happy this book's been written, right? <laughs> just with the wrong, wrong half of the knowledge. There was an old white man in Sydney called Bob Fuller, and uh, he pissed me off to no end, serious. You know, he chased me for two years uh, from the Macquarie University because somehow he got hold of my name and said, that fellow knows something about stars and, and stories. And so I had to give in. He just kept ringing all the time. So I was like, what the bloody hell do you want? Anyway, so um, he ended up doing a master's degree from the knowledge that I gave him. And we, we followed on and, and, of course, we went into bigger things. And, um, but I always made sure that, you know, I just say to him, mate, I can only tell you a little bit. And so what this book represents is only a little bit of our story. It's not, you know, this is only a tiny bit of the, the knowledge that we have. And um, we tell you all the stuff that we're allowed to tell you. 
Dwayne, then I want to ask about what, what motivated you to undertake this work? Well, actually, for, sorry, before that, did you realize it would take this long to, to write this book? And would you still have written the book had you been aware of <laughs> this almost decade long project? No, and of course, yeah, of okay. course, good answer. Um, good answer. It was, it was, it was quite a journey, and it's, it's, you know, working a lot in the Torres Strait has been quite an eye-opening experience. And it was Professor Martin Nakata who really offered me my first job, mentored me through the process, and um, helped me sort of shape the framework of this research over the years. So Martin Nakata is a Torres Strait Islander, the, the first to earn a PhD in Australia. And at the time, he was the, the director of the Neurogildi Indigenous Center at UNSW. And he brought this, you know, sort of redneck mid-Missouri boy in <laughs> to, to work on this field some. And he, I remember him sitting with me in, in the conference room at, at Neurogildi at the university and mapping out the future of indigenous astronomy in Australia. And he says, okay, here's what needs to be done in the broader spectrum of things. Here are the goalposts. Here's what we need to achieve. Of course, one of the first ones was getting a getting a major grant. So you know, we we worked on an ARC grant and got a decorate to, to work in the Torres Strait. But he always had this book as one of the major outcomes that was going to come from this. And the timing is about right. A little bit later than we thought, but we did go through two years of pandemic, right? So it was it was quite the journey. And of course, in the Torres Strait, um, I talked to a lot of different elders um, over the years, and. All of them were male, except for two, which was great uh, that I got to speak to those two. But they they talk about how you know there's this is the starting point of a longer journey, and um, that hopefully more people will be coming into this space. I'm happy to say that you know we've got a whole new generation of Aboriginal students who are working in the space now, um, who are carving out uh, careers and pathways and doing a lot of fantastic work. In fact, one one of those is uh, Pete Swanton, who's now doing his MPhil at ANU, and he's going to be working with Uncle Gilar and other elders to focus more on traditional knowledge and dark sky studies, because he himself was a Uwalare, the Miller Roy man. So that idea of inspiring that next generation, uh, both in sharing the knowledge, but also in, in taking up these kinds of academic endeavors, uh, Uncle Gilar, could you have ever imagined that when you maybe first met Dwayne all those years? In fact, when did you guys meet? I don't think I know that story. I don't remember. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I think we met. We met for the first time in person at UN, It was at UNSW, about 2014, 2013, something like that. Because we were down, yeah. I, the group we went out to the pub and yeah. had a pint and a feed, and we, we were do. chatting about stuff. Yeah, we do. The pub. Yeah. Nice. It is Australia, right? <laughs> so then I did. So I guess perhaps maybe not at that moment. Uh, it doesn't sound that auspicious, but. At what point did you realize that perhaps this endeavor could lead to new levels of, of uh, engagement in indigenous knowledge, and in particular that, that uh, engagement within academic circles like these, these universities? A lot of it goes back to um, when I started as a 14-year-old with my, the old people out in the bush. And um, I, was, I was lucky to be born at a period when you know, the last of my old people in the Uwalia and in the Western Gumroy mob, um, these guys were born in 1887, 1888, and they were still alive during the 1950s, 1960s, and so on. So at that period, towards the end of the 1960s, they started sort of talking and wanting to take us out, and so they, they got permission off the, old, off the parents to take boys to the bush. And... Um, you know, the, the net result is that um, they, they retained all that knowledge and uh, they took it underground because they kept telling, you know, don't ever talk about these things in front of a white fellow, you know. Um, and and that, that knowledge was always sort of then hidden from people and, and it included us as well because, you know, we were mixing with white people and, um, you know, they, they thought we'd become loose lips and say things out of turn. And so it was very... Our people didn't want the white people to understand and, and learn about us because they'd taken enough from us. And, um, and so that knowledge was very important to us and that's why we kept it near and dear to us. And, and so after a while, uh, when we went through the ceremonies and we realized the extent of the knowledge, I, I did anyway. But, and so by the time I sort of started university in Sydney, 
you know, these old guys are sort of in their 90s and, and in like this is early 70s. And so they're starting to open up the information and start to talk a lot more about um, what was in, in the universe and what was around us, you know, just around within our country. And so they, they painted this picture over a period of 20 years of, of learning. And, um, and then all of a sudden, when they finished with us, they then said, now you've got to talk to the women. Get them older. You've got to talk to them. And the women took us into a very different world, totally different world altogether. And so there were, there were limitations, of course. Um, and when we got into that, into that area, we got to understand a hell of a lot more. Um, because they were the nurturers, and then they, we understood the land a hell of a lot more. And we have a very different educational system uh, um, to that of Western Desert, for example, because I've been fortunate to do ceremony with them. And Central Australia, the same thing, so APY, um, all of those things. So we have a lot of knowledge. But then the question then is, how do we then sort of translate, get, how do we start mixing up with these white folks? They, they stole all of this stuff. And Whitefellow got a bad habit of going down there and getting his lawyer to put a IP on it, you know, and take ownership of the knowledge. You know, look how they mucked around with the Aboriginal land rights flag, you know, that don't belong to them, for God's sake. And, you know, that's a representation of the struggle. Um, and it's flying over there and nobody knows what the hell it means, you know. Um, so th there's, there's this dreadful fear. Uh, that if we give too much of this knowledge, then the white fellows will take ownership of it, and we don't want that to happen. And, and and the things that we talk about sitting down out there in the bush is that, you know, all them white fellows come out here and ask us questions, and they do a master's degree, they do a PhD on all this information that we're giving them. They go and write books about stuff. And I'm, not, I'm not talking about this one, but um, <laughs> uh, anyway. But but the thing is, they it, they when they then publish it. It's their knowledge. It's, it belongs to someone else. We've given them that knowledge. We've given it for free. And, and then we lose control of that knowledge. And, and then it's manipulated in, in a way where, you know, the, the narrative then is fixed into a new, um, a new form, format to, to fit the white narrative, the white way of thinking. And it's not black for the way of thinking. You know, and so it's so. This is these are some of the technicalities when we start talking about us introducing white people to our knowledge, because we we don't want that to be abused. We don't want it to be bastardized, and we don't want it to be prostituted. You know, through its misuse uh, in publications and the way they and the way they've done it in the past. And we we got to stop that. So. Yeah, I actually think it's very important, please. That generosity of spirit, as you say, that they've, they've taken, that white people have taken so much, but you're still willing to now give, but within your control. And I want to speak to you both about that perhaps fraught, sometimes fraught process. Um, how did you have uh, the trust in, uh, within Dwayne and Dwayne in respect? How did you uh, navigate that process, especially coming from outside, right? Like we're both international, it's a complete new world. So I'm very, very conscious, how did you navigate that relationship and write this book? I found out where he lived. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's the best answer. Oh, we've, we've, always had a, we've always had a fun rapport and it's, it's one of the situations where I was, I was very nervous for a long time about writing the book, the style it was going to take, how we were going to do it. What are the boundaries of the book writing industry? All these factors, but most importantly, how are we going to get the knowledge across in the book in a way that is beneficial, but not just extracting knowledge and sticking it on paper? Um, and I've got a number of colleagues from around the world who who were involved in the book. Um, you know, Dr. Annette Lee is a Lakota astrophysicist and the director of Native Sky Watchers, and we've we've been friends and colleagues for 12, 13 years, and and She's always been phenomenal at, at sharing, sharing knowledge, but in the right way. And we, I had this discussion with a great many people, including the elders and those colleagues like, like uh, Annette Lee and Professor Rangi Matamu and others. How do we do this? And the whole goal of the book really was about 
the framework of what is science. Because the narrative so heavily, not just in Australia, but around the world, is that these indigenous ways of knowing, I mean, Richard Dawkins through his two cents, and all this is all mythology and anthropology. No, it's not. What you think is anthropology is the mechanism by which the knowledge is transmitted. But what about the knowledge? You keep saying it's not real science. It keeps getting discredited as, oh, it's astrology. It's like, oh, for crap. Jeez, I mean, the number of panel I took trying to deal with that, those arguments. So I thought, well, that needs to be the focus of this book. Um, and we just give some examples from around the world, but really dig into the science, because the science isn't Western. The idea of this is talking about how eclipses work, how variable stars work, about supernova, about the movement of planets, as I noted period of Venus, appearance of sunspots, aurora cycles. This isn't something that's Western. I mean, yeah, Western scientists finally figured it out, but this was long known by First Peoples a long time ago. And if Western scientists stop treating this like it's mythology and folklore and start looking at it for the scientific text that it is, and it's a lot more than that, but that's one element of it, one layer of it that is very complex, we can do a lot of things work together. So instead of saying, well, here's Western science and all the other ways of knowing are down here, no. We're treating them with equal respect. We're learning from each other. I'm very happy to say that, you know, the work we're doing in Astro 3D and other areas, we're doing this collaborative research now. We're, we're looking at how we can have astrophysicists and elders working together and assisting each other in various ways. This is where you're going to find true innovation. And that was kind of the motive, not kind of, that was the motivation of the book. But I even, didn't even really write the book necessarily for a specific audience. I just wanted to platform the elders and as a scientist, I knew that language that people would understand a bit more when it comes to Western science, but I tried not to frame it in terms of Western science necessarily. You know, we have Western science examples, but the idea is knowing that this stuff is a lot more ancient than that. This stuff is complex, it's rich. People have no idea. And I've only gotten the tiniest, tiniest like preschool, kindergarten level glimpse of that, and even that we just barely talk about in the book. And in fact, there were times in the book only in like September, October, this past September, October, where there, where David Bozen was talking to me about something, and I was very curious about this artwork he did on eclipses. Whole ceremony tied around that. And I'm like, if you have this whole ceremony, that has to be planned in advance, right? He's like, yeah, <laughs> of course. Um, if you know anything about the history of astronomy, there's never any credit given to indigenous cultures about figuring out or being able to predict eclipses. It's not there. And here's a Torres Strait Islander ceremony tied around eclipses well in advance. I said, okay, well, you know, how does that work? He says, well, we are informed by the Zugabu Mabaik. The Zugabu Mabaik is a traditional astronomer. It literally translates to star person. They're somebody who's taken when they're early teens, they're taken to the quad. This is sort of a university slash parliament house. They go through seven years of intensive instruction, which sounds a lot like master's, master's, and PhD here, right? They go through that process, and they basically graduate as a Zugabul Mabaik. And they have a broad knowledge of the stars, but they also specialize in particular stars and constellations. Sounds like professional astronomers, right? And it is their job to keep track of everything that's happening in the sky when the stars are rising and setting, what the moon and sun are doing, what everything is doing. And that includes the prediction of eclipses. So this is something I just sort of was putting in the very last minute um, and just really excited about because that is nowhere, as we say, in the literature. But this is old knowledge for these, these communities up in the Torres Strait and elsewhere. I know we were talking about eclipses today having quite the conversation. So, you know, that was, that was the main motivation behind the book, and there's so many voices from around the world in it, and I'm, I hope we can change that narrative, that this knowledge contains a tremendous degree of science. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I really want to have the audience ask some questions, but I'm, I really have some more. Um, okay, I will try to... You all want to ask a question or two, right? If I see nods. I'll only ask one or two more. I'll ask the tough one. How did you make the cut on what went in this book? It sounds like we have many sequels potentially to look forward to, um, both in terms of your writing, uh, Dwayne, but also Uncle Gilder and what you were sharing 
uh, with along with the other elders, um, how did you decide on what to share? Uh, we gave him all the superficial stuff, you know. So, um, so what he got is all the kid stories. Yeah. We we leave all the adult stories behind because he wouldn't understand it. Yeah. Yeah. And so th there's there is a great deal of knowledge out there that um, that deals with the creation. Yeah. And when you start getting into creation stories from our perspective, then you start messing up and clouding the waters and muddying the waters because, you know, you then have to deal with all the Christian beliefs and um, Muslim beliefs. And, and so what we try and do is to try and protect our knowledge in that sacred space um, about spirituality because we, quite frankly, um, when we talk about the stars, like we call about, we call that place like in my language called Bulima, that's the sky camp. Yeah. And if you if you've seen the story, uh, the video called Star Stories of the Dream, which Billy Gilbert made uh, with myself and Bob Fuller when he was doing his master's degree, the, the the thing that we talk about is our people have a story about the Big Bang in our story, and in that. Big Bang story, we talk about how everything tipped upside down. Yeah. And so for us, that river up there tipped upside down. And that Milky Way, the massive expanse that you see up there, we call it Warrumbool. And Warrumbool is that big river in the sky. And the people who are on here now, who occupy this earth as us on, in Australia, you know, we either come from the light side or we come from the dark side. And that's what them white fellows call a moiety. Yeah, so you divide the world into two. And so we, we each of the, each, the clan groups and our skin groups either belong to the light side or they belong to the dark side. And all of that is dictated to us from up there. Yeah. So we have to know what side of the camp, that river we lived on. Yeah. And so when you when you look at what, what what's up there, I keep telling people, they say, when Aboriginal people do art, you look at the artwork, the artwork is a view from above. They're describing and paint their landscape. And they know exactly where things are within that landscape. And so when you look at that, and then you, you're doing, you're learning, when we look up there, you don't look at it as if it's on the earth. You look at a mirror image up there. So you have to turn it around and understand how that works. And then so if you're talking about that up there, well, then you have to reverse that around and look at it on the earth in a different way because it's, it's the opposite. It's, it's turned around. So it's a mirror image. And so what's here is above. And what's above is also here as well. And, but in the middle of all of that is a lot of stuff that relates to the people, relates to the spirit, relates to, to everything that we, we understand, that we know. And so... Everything was restored here. Um, in our story, we, everything is restored here on, on this earth because they mucked up up there yeah, in the old time before that tipped upside down. And so that's why this place up here is so important because we come from there and we're going back there. Yeah. When we leave here, we're going back there. We're not, you know, only our bones, this meat and flesh that, that we call, you know, as, what is it, the physiology of, of man you know, and woman, you know, that don't last long, well, it melts off your skin when you die and it all rots into the ground and be you become earth. Yeah, but that spirit, he travelled back home. Yeah. And so this is what um, we, we protect because there's a lot of knowledge that's within our circles that, um, yeah, white folk will never understand. We, we don't think because your, your mind is too set in the way and I'm being critical now. I'm sorry about you, Mob. But, um, but your mind is set because you've been trained to think a certain way. You have a certain belief. And so we, we come from very different cultures, very different backgrounds. So our worldview is very much very different from you. And the way things, what influences me, is very different from what influences you. Yeah? And your, your values is very different to mine when it comes to land. And space so um, but 
you know, we help you scientists to get along because um, we give you a profession now because now you're starting to come into the Aboriginal space and you're starting to realise that there's a, you know, this ancient wisdoms and knowledge that's on this place here now enables the scientists to say, oh, shoot, that's new. Okay, that's a bit of a, you know, okay, there's an hypothesis here and we'll go out and sort of find out how that works. And, and so, you know, um, so getting involved with Aboriginal people uh, and the Torres Strait Islanders certainly opens up a, a new doorway, you know, to university studies to understand the world uh, for the first time. And thank goodness the old people took a lot of stuff underground and kept it in a place where we could revive it and, and reteach it again. Um, because the Brits who came here just had no idea what they what they found and what was here. And thank goodness we're able to sort of now begin to um, tell a little bit of it um, so that you appreciate the damage that's been done to an ancient society that um, has so much knowledge. Um, yeah, and, and you're yet to learn. It's, there's a lot of, a lot of challenges here. Okay, thank you. I... I really want to throw open to just one or two audience questions. Just okay, I immediately hand one up. Awesome. Um, and then I realized, how do we do that, Dwayne? Do we have a roving mic? I've got one. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> You might have the question directed at you, Dwayne. Obviously, we're all here because we're really interested in Aboriginal knowledge, in Aboriginal astronomy. And with that comes a lot of opportunities for things like writing books and doing other programs which, you know, come from a sort of Western lens. Uh, and you mentioned before how well, there is this history of people taking this knowledge and publishing it in a white way where it can then be bastardised. It's taken away, it becomes someone else's knowledge and it's handled in a different way. And so as an Aboriginal woman interested in this field, I was wondering if you had any advice for ways that I can ensure the way I engage with this knowledge, the way I share this knowledge, isn't actually just going to end up bastardising it in the same way that we have historically. Thank you for that question um, and statement. I, um, when I first started teaching at uh, university, at the University of New England, um, I was asked to review some of their courses. And, um, and Professor Anne Eckerman um, sort of said to me, oh, uh, Professor Anne Eckerman said to me, Michael, I want you to have a look at the Aboriginal Studies program that we're teaching here through the, the university and, and give us some ideas, rewrite stuff if necessary, or even write, new, write courses. And so when I looked at all the readings, recommended readings for the studies, the Aboriginal Studies course, I, um, I began to put red in red, warning, read with caution, you know, like Elk and stuff and, and Stanners and, and um, other, other writers of um, ethnology in, in the Aboriginal space. Because I actually, when I read a lot of that stuff, um, I started realising, okay, I know those names that you're talking about when you went west of New South Wales or southwest Queensland. I know the names of those people that you actually interviewed. And I do know that they told you a lot of shit. Yeah? <laughs> and so I'm saying, please don't read that as if it's a, you know, a biblical text, because it's not so. It's not so. One of the classic examples of this is um, New South Wales in 1946 engaged a woman by the name of Janet, Ma uh, Janet Matthews. And they sent her out to northwest New South Wales to Brewarren and Walgett to have a look to see if the people were still promising marriages. And um, so I'm reading her report to the New South Wales government. And um, so I, you know, I'm looking at all the names that are there, the men she was talking with. No women, but she's talking to all the men at Brewarren and Walgett. And uh, the Walgett mob saying, oh, if you go into, down to Brewarren, then Blackford will tell you all sorts of shit down there. Don't, you know, don't worry about them fellas. And Brewarren was saying the same thing about the Blackfellas at Walgett. Yeah. But it was interesting at Brewarrina where she, where she was sitting on the mission talking with them, interviewing the men. Um, she made a note in her, in her diary, that, in her records, that there was an Aboriginal woman sitting on a drum next to the camp. And um, she's sitting with these men talking about all this. 
And um, then all of a sudden she makes reference to the fact that this woman spoke to him in language. And one of the men got up and grabbed her by the arm, pulled her into the house, slammed the door shut, pulled it shut, put a wire around it, tied a knot in the wire, wrapped the wire around. And she was a bit shocked about this man locking this woman in the house. And I busted out laughing to myself, yeah. I'm thinking, I know what that woman was saying to that man. She was telling you men, stop telling that woman bullshit. Stop telling her lies, yeah. And so that's what makes it so important to, to put those signs and all of those old ethnology reports. It's the same as the linguistic stuff that they're doing now. Like I, I, you know, I grew up speaking language. I grew up with people who spoke language and I'm listening to people at universities, white fellows and white teachers, teaching our language at university and at, at high schools. And, the, and these people, are, they got no idea about phonetics. They got no idea that, you know, if you say something differently, you change the whole bloody meaning, you know. And if you don't understand suffixes and prefixes and how they're used in our language, then, you know, you're putting someone out in space out there, you know, without a rope. You know, these guys have got no idea how you can impact the language. And so our language it, it, today is even being abused. And, and, and they say, oh, we got this out of this work by Ribble, or we got this out of, out of some old, uh, you know, old knowledge, or we went out sort of writing stories and writing a bit of the language as they went. But I was saying to them, have a look at how old those blokes were. Yeah? Half of those blokes probably half deaf. They didn't have hearing aids in those days. And so how in the world are they going to pick up the phonetics? You know, and they and they wrote it the way they heard it. Um, and if you're partly deaf and you're, you know, 50, 60 year old, 70 year old, I don't mean to criticize it, I'm in that age group now. Um, but I'm pretty good at hearing. Um, but if you don't get that right, then you change it. And so what's happened is that you're corrupting a culture, you're corrupting a language. And it's that's the danger that we have that's confronting our people right now. All right, we have uh, about 20 minutes left uh, in this space. We have chance to uh, mingle, to share more knowledge, to buy the book and maybe make a donation. Um, but before we do all of that, could you please join me in thanking uh, Uncle Giller and Dwayne Hamaker for this evening. He's a bad compare. He only allowed one question. Well, <laughs> I don't, I, I'm sorry. Should we have more? No, I don't know. It was a one more. He's now making me feel incredibly guilty about that. Oh, right at the back. I thought we were not going to do this. Okay, okay. And then, and then I promise as a comparer, I will, I will end this and everyone can mingle. I, know, I noticed they made you all have a drink of wine before you started here. So it was to open your mind up, I guess, and lay it a, a bit of free speech. Hi. My question is to both gentlemen at the front. Moving forward, keeping your culture with respect and dealing with it in a way that respects its history and carries forward its true meaning, who is going to be able to moderate that on your behalf? Is there a framework that's been set up for this to happen? Because you've just blown my mind with what you've said tonight, all the information that you haven't had that we don't share because it's not public knowledge, it's covered by law. And relating to Crystal's question, the framework around that has to be agreed so that the information is true because it sounds like some of the books that we've got from the past aren't worth reading because they're not true. Um, so for correct information going forward so we can understand and respect the culture and the value of the knowledge that exists. Where do we go from here? Uh, there are there are there are, there are a couple of authors that I that I do really like. Um, uh, when Elkin wrote the book um, Men of High Degree, um, there's some fantastic work in that. 
yeah, he, he did some really great work. The other author who's done a lot of political socio um, studies of Aboriginal society was um, C.D. Rowley, um, who, who did some excellent writings. Um, then the other one who, who did some magnificent work um, was uh, Ronald and Catherine Burnt. And, you know, you, you can't sort of ignore the work that those um, husband and wife did. Um, there's some magnificent work there. The, it's some of the early uh, um, guys who went out and did work who were, you know, surveyors, who were, you know, just stockmen and, uh, and um, who, who else? There's some, some school teachers that went out there. There were some retired doctors. Um, and there were a lot of religious pastors or father priests or whatever they are who got out into a lot of those communities as well and started, you know, writing. Um, like Gribble did a lot of work. Um, and Gribble ended up in the Pilbara after he left New northern New South Wales um, and northwest New South Wales, sorry. So there, there, there's a lot of that stuff. And then you, you have a look at, um, um, yeah, Spencer Gill and all, all, that, all that work. You know, these guys were surveyors. You know, they were basically learning themselves. They, so they were writing. They were not men of, of, of science. They were not men of... Uh, of that profession, but they took an interest in it and they wrote about it. Um, but the question is, how much of that information, you know, do you really take on board um, as a, as a, as a, you know, in in terms of educational material and learning your way and trying to understand Aboriginal society? Um, no, I think we're we're at a we're at a period now where I think we have access to people. And um, the old ones are a little bit more um, now, uh, I suppose, open to to questions and open to being a participant in a lot of this stuff. And um, you're getting a lot, of, a lot of good stuff now from from people. Um, I hope that somewhere along the line, someone talks to the women before all the women knowledge disappears, um, because you know we we we've, we've been lucky. We've just caught a lot of. Um, people with knowledge, and there's not many people who have a full, extensive um, breadth of knowledge, and and we need to capture that um, quickly. And you know, people like um, Dwayne and that old fellow who pestered me, old Bob Fuller, sort of you know stuck their guns and said, "Okay, no, we need to get this knowledge. This is important for everybody." Um, and it comes back to that question: How do we control that knowledge, and how do we uh, you know, impart that knowledge onto others, and how deep do we go? Um, and that's going to be up to the respective elders and the people who are hold, who are the knowledge holders, and they'll make those decisions. And um, um, hopefully, we can protect it and, and pass it on really well to a lot of the people and a lot of our kids, and particularly the university ones who are doing the studies now. Um, but our, my fear with that um, is, do our kids become educated to be able to record and, and, and keep all our knowledge or are they become enculturated into a foreign system um, and all of a sudden they're not using it, they're using it like an ordinary scientist without having any personal association with that and so that it, it becomes a distant um, sort of past and it's, it's something thought of as a past, something is not now and going forward in the future which belongs to us, which, which makes us who we are. That's, that's a bit of a problem. Absolutely, and I think one of the one of the things you can do is, is a wrap up and a shout out is, we've heard a lot from white dudes, right? Um, fortunately, there is a whole generation of Aboriginal uh, people who are walking in these two worlds, who are studying astrophysics and paving out careers and pathways in this. Huge shout out to uh, Crystal Dinopoli, who asked a question, yes? Yep. Working on a, an honors degree in, in astrophysics at Monash, you have your own radio show on Triple R called in, Indigenuity, and you're now also working for the Astro 3D Center of Excellence. Yeah, I, I reached congratulations person. on the appointment, Woo. by the way. Uh, Carly Noon and ANU, uh, both women are, are Gamilaroi women doing a PhD uh, working in, in astrophysics and also indigenous knowledge and education outreach, and Radri, uh woman Kirsten Banks, who's also doing a a PhD at UNSW, 
who is uh, not quite famous on TikTok. So there's a there's a whole generation of people coming out into this who can who can work in that pathway. Because right now, the one statistic that I hate the most in this field is in Australia. Right now, there's one Aboriginal PhD qualified astrophysicist. That's Dr. Stacy Mater at the CSIRO. That's a ridiculous number, but in the coming years, that's going to rapidly change. All right. Okay. Where are the Wurundjeri and Bunurong women and stories? I can't wait to hear them if they can be shared. And I respect that they may not be able to be shared. I didn't learn them. Did you, did you go? Yeah. Where would the Wurundjeri go? Yeah. But we've got a noisy. Um, we're working together to try and, well, it's uh, regenerating the knowledge and, and also about strengthening that with each other because it's about empowering two of their future generations to come up through the ranks. And hopefully universities are a tool to be able to, able to use it as a tool to unpack and flip it in a way that we can control the knowledge and ensure that we grow our young people stronger through the sharing of that knowledge. That was part of my PhD, how to identify an elder and the roles and responsibility of an elder and how do we look at other opportunities to re-empower re back to our younger generations. Find that space, you know. Because we get caught up in these systems and and it, it's not a negative, it's about these systems are here, but what we've got to do is flip it and hopefully use it as a tool to unpack. But it's also about rigour of research and understand that as a tool and listening and going out into communities and celebrating the diversities. We're not all going to tell the same story. So, you know, and like what you said, Uncle, there, it is about what what do we want to share and how, or when I, I suppose at this stage, I, when I do co-authoring in books now, so that it's, I still have part of my ownership in there, whatever ownership is about, and how we share it with our younger generation. It's empowering our to feel that there's a sense of their purpose and what they put back into community. Thank you. Well, that has been a discussion well worth extending this evening for, but I really will stop failing my duties as a compare. We're bringing this bit to a close, continue the discussion, continue to share knowledge, and enjoy the rest of Science Gallery in Melbourne. Thank you all. See, the good thing is I don't have two signatures on people like, so it's, uh... Look at that, that's not even... Uh, well, it's these fellow stories. I'm just doing the, doing the star of the... The fellow story. Wait, 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 wait. The what? Yeah, right? Well, this is all just the kindergarten stuff, and that's a lot. That's right. I even say that. Yeah.